I'm, I'm, as you said, I'm Robert Zigvide. I work with IOActive. I do lots of compliance and uh, a fair bit of threat modeling, code review, and penetration tests, stuff in general like that. Um, as we go through today, I, I would like to reiterate what was said at the end of the last talk. Please, if you have questions at any time, do not hesitate to ask. Uh, I would rather have a conversation with you folks than just talk at you. Uh, it, it helps everybody out. I feel it makes it much more inter much more pleasurable to be interactive, both for me and for you. Um, and, and I guess it's, we'll try to get this done so we can all go to lunch, right? Um, starting with the interaction, I want to I want to start not with this question, but I would like to ask you: have, Can you can I see a, a show of hands of who's participated in a, in threat modeling? Okay, about half of you. Now, can the other half of you that lied raise your hands, please? Because you have done threat modeling, just maybe not as a formal process. Some people call it risk assessment. Some people call it problem solving. Some people have to do it when they drive to work. I have to do it to get out my door in the morning because of my kids. Um, it, it's, it's, everybody does this exercise as a matter of habit. It, it's, it's how you filter and make your way through your day. This is about helping you realize that and being able to put it into the more formal uh, aspects of, of threat modeling. So those of you that did raise your hands, uh, I'm going to pick on a couple of you. Can you tell me what threat modeling means to you? Yeah, go ahead, please. Finding ways to protect your assets. Okay. Uh, basically, a, a systematic approach to walking through a system, identifying uh, the, the threats against the system, where those threats uh, have been mitigated or where they haven't, and being able to find ways to, to go back and mitigate the, those currently unmitigated threats. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Um, having your teams understand how the system really works. That could be a threat modeling exercise of its own. <laughs> yeah. Find a way to bust your app. That's one thing that I liked what I said. Everybody does it. If you're a penetration tester, you do it. And that's one of the ways. You're trying to find the most vulnerable points in, in, in the application or whatever process. Uh, uh, the movie sneakers, they did it to get into the building and all that kind of stuff. That that's all processes of threat modeling, but it's not made formalized. It's just something you kind of keep in your head. It's prioritizing your targets. That that's that's a lot of what this is. And sometimes it's prioritizing your targets based on what's got the most benefit, what's the most valuable to you. Or sometimes that value change. It's not the value, but it's how well you can, how well you can hide your tracks. So there's lots of different activities that can that can take place that that happen in threat modeling. Hackers use it all the time. Uh, so for me, that's what it is. It's, it's I like the the enumeration bits that that were mentioned. That's definitely a p key factor of formalized threat modeling because you can't realize what your threats are until you know what you've got as far as assets. Um, and and then there, that also brings out the approach that was a very asset centric approach. The other may, more com not more common. Another common approach to threat modeling is an attacker-centric approach, which was what you were going about, is how to bust your app. So we like to see both of those things, and, and too often you don't see those two work together to create a more complete uh, uh, threat model, um, which that is also a myth. There is no such thing as a complete threat model. You, it's a pipe dream. You're never going to reach it. So you do a best effort, given your time and resources. So as far as teams go that were mentioned, th there are some very important things that you should cover with your teams. First, you need to make sure that you're talking the same language, using the same words. And then after you've decided th that you're using the same words, you need to make sure your team all understand them the same ways. Asset can mean something different to one person than another. An attack is another particular nasty one and then there's the actual definition of a threat versus a vulnerability which causes can cause confusion among teams I see some laughter is this because you've seen this happen yes so speaking the same language is very very important 
uh, it, it lets you create a unified message that anybody in your team can understand. I'm sure many of you have seen these words before. Uh, this is one of the more common, t probably the most popular taxonomy right now. This comes out of Microsoft, they're Stride and Dread. Um, st Stride is all about the type of the threat and Dread is all about how that threat is, has an impact and it also can translate into vulnerabilities. And I'm not gonna go into what all the definitions of those terms are right now because I think that would take away from what I'm really trying to get it as a message as far as the best practices. We're not here to learn threat modeling. We're here to, I'm, I'm hoping most, based on the show of hands, most of you have already participated in this enough to be able to know the basic terminology. But if you do have any questions, please ask and we'll, we can go over that. So. And any CISPs out there? might have recognized these uh, three little letters. Uh, the CIA is what I like to call them. It's actually the terminology that I prefer. Um, if, you, if you look back at the, at the stride model, um, these, this is a different way of putting it, but I feel most of these fall under uh, uh, elevation of privilege. An information disclosure is an elevation of privilege because you're getting access to information you weren't supposed to have. Uh, tampering is definitely an elevation of privilege because you're doing something you weren't supposed to do, but that's that's a that's a minor thing. Uh, but it really can be boiled down to the, these basic three tenets. And when we're talking about threat modeling, I prefer if a if an organization that I'm helping create a threat model for hasn't adopted a language, I prefer this for its simplicity, because one of the, the one of the problems with the starting a threat model is it is or introducing threat modeling into an organization is it creates uh, it, it's known as a daunting it's a daunting heavyweight task to perform and I'm trying to help move away from that by making it a little more streamlined even from the beginning of a development process or a project's process. And so I prefer this because I like it's nice and simple and then I get to make fun of three letter agencies. There's no three letter agencies here, are there? <laughs> um, so this is, we're talking about starting threat modeling. When, when should you start? This is one of the biggest questions that happen. Um, there are things that you need to know before you start threat modeling. I have been brought into a formal threat modeling process when they hadn't even really decided what the project was supposed to actually accomplish. And we went back to the drawing board so many times as the business requirements changed sometimes because of the threat model, but, uh, which is good, but they changed the, the, the tenant, the, the, the requirements that were coming down from the business were not completely solidified and they changed even res, res, without, the, without the threat model worker. Just because business decided something different needed to happen because they heard a new cool, cool term. And so you can get into threat modeling too early uh, so you need to have solidified what your project is actually going to do. Um, and, and that includes what, what you're going to be building and, and, what, and then identifying what needs to be protected. Especially if you're taking an asset-centric approach to threat modeling, you got to know what you're trying to protect before you can do any real uh, modeling against that. And it's never ever too late to start threat modeling. You can start it after a release cycle. You can start at the beginning of a new release cycle. I like to start, I wanna, if I can't start at the beginning, I like to start it at the beginning of the QA and testing cycle because it can help you create uh, your test plans. And how often do you threat model? Well. I think it's an ongoing process. If you ever print out a threat model, it's just like with a compliance or anything of that nature. You, you've created a, a piece of paper or stack of papers and killed a few trees, then it's a stamp in time of what your best guess of the threats and vulnerabilities are at that time. I prefer 
to see a living document. Uh, so I, I like to see threat modeling as an ongoing process. It becomes the story of your project because you can capture all of the business requirements from the very beginning and track how it's morphed through revi different revisions or even through a single cycle. You can see how things have changed. Um, and like I said before, I like, I like starting one. If you can't get it at the beginning, starting at the QA process works pretty well because you're already doing some of that when you're trying to decide what to test in your project. In, in an application centric, it's even if you're doing functional testing, a lot of, well, what if the, what ifs happen and you can start your threat modeling process just with that. And, and then, of course, the security push because as we said in a penetration test, you're doing threat modeling in your head anyway so that's one point at which you can formalize it a little bit and start. Yeah, go ahead. I understand about trying it in QA because that's where you pretty much got a stable product or project that's already been put in. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times as a developer as well as a security auditor, I've been on both ends. When I was a security auditor, a lot of times what happens is the client brings us in and says, okay, we got this project and it's going live in three weeks. You do your security assessment and then you know give us whatever stamp of approval is and then we move into production mm -hmm. in three weeks. At that point in time, how do you approach how do you how do you do that? What do you do? Say, okay, it's already been done. What am I supposed to do? Give you a stamp and just say done and then you go on? So that kind of comes like a threat modeling checkbox, so to right. speak, That's right? All okay. You do when you say, say, I, I love the fact that you brought it up. If you, if you approach threat modeling, is it something I have to do as, yes. to get part of my SDL? You're not doing it right. You, you, you're, you've got the wrong perspective on the entire thing. And it's it, those threat models, and I've read a bunch of them, uh, those threat models become stagnant. They're not maintained. They're often not reflective of even the version when they looked at it. Not enough time was put into it. it, it Unfortunately, it's still a time-intensive process. Uh, that's what, where, we're, where I'm trying to, to project here is that you, using activities that you're already doing can contribute to a threat model with a lower <coughs> overhead. But if you're looking at some, if you've got people coming at you, we have to have a threat model on this project. You have a week go, and especially if it's only one person. Threat modeling should never be done by one person. So should I reduce such a project? I can't answer that question. Uh, <laughs> depends on the organization. Uh, the best that, so advice I would have there is to say, look, from a, from a security standpoint, if you want this to work and be an effective tool, that is not the appropriate approach to take. I'm, I'm more than willing to work on a threat model, but this is not a, this is an ongoing longer term process as part of the release cycle or your SDL, it, that's going to be what's needed to make it actually work as an effective tool and not a checkbox I got past this. And it's then a useless piece of paper and it does cost you a lot to do, to have not done something that's worth very much. Well, our compromise has always been okay. A lot of times that's what we're facing. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to get into it with the client or whoever that is saying, you know, get us in early enough, we'll be part of this whole process with you. We go through the security checklist with you, you know, make sure we're sure that the product delivery is good, so on and so forth. But a lot of time we face that, in fact, 50% of what we're facing a lot of projects like that. And the best we can do is we say, okay, we'll do a scan, we'll identify some vulnerabilities in there, you know, we'll try to do that, and then maybe you push it into production, it's mission critical um, mm -hmm. application, therefore you have to push it into production, you can't delay your implementation date, and then we'll try to remediate something like that shortly three months or 90 days within implementation, you know, with, you know. Right. That's, well, that's the best we can do. Or you could, you could take that as a starting point and be proactive as releases come on from, their, from that point on. As I said, there's, nothing, there's no such thing as a complete threat model anyway. So ha make it a starting point, make a best effort. It, it, if you take it as a best effort and then, you can, and then you dedicate your team to maintaining that a little bit as the project continues, Five minutes here or there, if you, if you, I, I get into this a little bit later, but I'd rather have a conversation. So uh, if, if you have people that say, well, what if this happens to this project? Well, record it, and then that becomes part of your threat model, and then you can create a mitigation based on it, and you can identify what that what if might affect. And, and 
little bits of